Good afternoon. My name is Craig Cohen. I'm Vice President for Research and Programs at CSIS. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, we're here to talk about Pakistan and the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. We have two of the top analysts here in Washington with us, so it's going to be a terrific session. Just to my right is Bruce Rydell. He's at the Brookings Institute. We don't hold that against him, though. Um, he's the author of a recent, terrific recent book on Pakistan called Deadly Embrace, Pakistan, America, and the Future of Global Jihad. Bruce has a long, distinguished career in government, and he was famously led President Obama's AFPAC review in 2009. Bruce, thank you for being here. Tony Cordesman is the Arlie Burke uh, Chair in Strategy at CSIS. He's probably CSIS's most prolific and well-known scholar. Um, Tony has a, also a long and distinguished career in government. Uh, in May, he authored a report uh, looking a national net assessment on Pakistan, and he's recently back from Afghanistan as well. So Tony won the coin toss. He's going to speak first, probably for about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, then Bruce is going to follow. Then we're going to have a conversation among the three of us and then open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, Tony, okay. please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And let me apologize in advance. I actually am going to use PowerPoint occasionally. The good news is I'll use it very quickly. If you want to actually look at it, We've given you a sheet which indicates where these slides are on the web, and since I'm going to tie this to what I have recently learned in Pakistan, we've also given you a reference to a report that brings you up to date on the situation there. Let me begin by saying that I think the operative aspect of this session is the phrase perilous course. To be perfectly honest, in the real world, I think bilateral relations are as good as they are likely to get, as bad as they happen to be. There is always the possibility that Pakistan could find itself thrust by its own internal pressures into an open confrontation with the Afghan Taliban, come fully to grips with the remnants of Al-Qaeda. But much as I would like to see that happen from an American viewpoint, quite frankly, I do not believe it is likely. I think it is far more likely that Pakistan will continue to pursue a strategy which in many ways is different from ours with different priorities and to focus on its own internal security dynamics. And as for the phrase regional solutions, after 50 years of hearing about them, my instinctive reaction is to leave the room the moment anybody mentions the phrase. Uh, frankly, I think a regional solution is about as likely as an early Arab-Israeli peace settlement or a Congress that can both cut revenues and entitlement expenditures. I think the real issue for us, the issue that dominates relations, is the role of Pakistan in the Afghan conflict. And at a point where we are headed towards an undefined but almost certain real transition in 2014. I think that not only is going to shape our near-term relations, but really confront both countries with the question of what is the enduring US role in Central and South Asia and how does Pakistan fit into that process? So let me begin with the issue of how Pakistan fits into the Afghan war. Now let me note, this particular slide is drawn from the time I spent working with General McChrystal and the team that was developing the strategy that was recommended to Bruce and others in Washington. Pakistan fits into a set of problems that are ones we will or will not solve in the course of the Afghan war. One is whether we can defeat the insurgents tactically, and there we are making, I think, very significant progress. Another is whether we can eliminate their control and influence over the population, which is more problematic. At this point in time, the idea of creating an effective NATO approach, an integrated ISAF approach, is moot. 
it isn't going to happen, countries are departing, caveats are not being reduced. We are seeking to build up an effective Afghan national security force. Those of you who have seen the papers over the last few days probably realize that there is a major gap between 2014 as a date and the fact that that particular buildup can't occur before 2016 to 2018. We have the problem of finding a way of creating an effective, legitimate Afghan government. It is perhaps a warning to all of us that Karzai is supposed to leave office in 2014, the transition year. We have the search for an integrated civil military effort, which we had optimism about in 2009 and would not have optimism about today as those of you who have seen the Washington Post may realize, it is something that we cannot achieve at this point in time. And then finally, we come down to the reality that winning in Afghanistan, unless it means some kind of more stable Pakistan and far better relations with Pakistan, will almost certainly not achieve a stable strategic transition or outcome. We may win the war, but we cannot control the future of the region. And it's important to note that was recognized in the new strategy. I won't read you the slide, but it's sometimes forgotten that all of these warnings were given very clearly to the White House and to the Congress and particularly the warning about the challenge of Pakistan. Now I mentioned different strategic goals and I think this is something we cannot alter through dialogue or aid or good intentions. Pakistan can see that we are going to leave. The question is when and in what way, but even under the most optimistic conditions, 2014 is not far enough in the future for Pakistan to see the U.S. as committed indefinitely at high levels to Afghanistan. Its goals in Afghanistan are to achieve and expand its own influence, particularly in the Pashtun areas, to block India from having any ability, in their phrase, to encircle Pakistan through influence in Afghanistan, to weaken some areas and strengthen others. And this geography explains in many ways why Pakistan is not going to willingly confront Al-Qaeda or the Afghan Taliban, either in the Fatah area or Baluchistan. We can succeed on occasion with limited pressure, the way that we are giving aid is normally spelled B-R-I-B-E, but in general, what it may or may not achieve is the ability to rent some degree of limited support and compliance, as long as it's sustained. India will continue to play the game as a third player, and in fairness to Pakistan, India's role may be more moderate because its needs are more moderate, but it is a player in this equation. When we look at the challenge of relations, these slides are not mine. They come from experts in the area. We are basically dealing with a Pakistan which is pursuing its goals, as well as the search for stability on a much broader level, and as well as a much higher priority confrontation with India. Nothing we do is going to change that equation in the near term. It drives what happens within the Pakistani military, within the Pakistani intelligence structure, and basically this is the group that dominates the Pakistani government's behavior in practical terms and will continue to during the length of this war. We have contributed to the problems, but let me just note, for any of you who wonder about what I'm saying, many people never saw the report the President sent to Congress several months ago. 
it's a very good idea to read it because in it is a very clear warning that what I've just outlined to you is not a personal view, but a view in a set of concerns which represents U.S. policy as presented to the Congress. And it is not a casual set of judgments. It came hard, and this document was debated with a great deal of interest and concern. Now let me just note, what does that lead us to? It leads us where we are. Last week, we heard U.S. experts in Pakistan describe U.S. and Pakistani relations as being at their worst since 2001. I think that's a fair judgment. Pakistan cannot easily separate itself from us, not given the aid, not given the value in some ways of our presence, to the extent it actually serves Pakistani interests. We cannot separate ourselves from Pakistan, but public opinion, tensions with the Pakistani intelligence community, tensions with the Pakistani military have grown steadily for the last six months, and it is very unlikely they will diminish, particularly if we announce that we are making major troop cuts and we put ourselves on a vector where Pakistan can see we are leaving quickly. But whether that would be any different if we were leaving slowly and had less serious troop cuts is somewhat uncertain. When you look at this, the supply line is critical. You can talk about Pakistan as being of great strategic interest, but it isn't. Pakistan is of tactical interest during this war because we need the supply lines. It is of tactical interest because we need its support in the Fatah area and the Baluchi area to the extent we can get it. Aside from that, on a global basis, this is not a critical or in many ways important American strategic interest. As for operations, Pakistan has acted to some extent in areas under pressure that help us, but these are primarily the areas which also affect its own security. Not the Afghan Taliban, not the Haqqani network, not the operations of Al-Qaeda or Sheikh Omar, Mullah Omar, but the direct areas of interest to Pakistan. In the areas where Al-Qaeda has been most active, there have been Pakistani forces, and there has been no Pakistani action. This is an order of battle people like to ignore, but it is a fact that Pakistan has had troops and capabilities in the area. Now, very quickly going through the numbers, they have built up capabilities, they have taken casualties. Unfortunately, in the way they fought, they've also, in many areas, simply ended up compounding the alienation of people by displacing them. That's not been true everywhere. There has been some corrective action, but in general, one of the great problems Pakistan faces is, even when the military acts, the government cannot. The civil side remains inept, whether it is a flood or it is dealing with displaced people in combat. Public opinion, you obviously cannot see the details here, but it's very mixed for operations in the FATA area. That's different from SWAT. It's different from the areas that are close to the immediate interests of Pakistanis outside the areas of interest to us. And when it comes down to the attitudes in popular terms, that Pakistanis have toward the United States, we are by far the most unpopular single factor, aside from India, in Pakistani public opinion. And that was true when a survey was taken some six months ago. Looking at the indicators, the situation has deteriorated steadily since that time. A lot of the reason for this is obvious. Pakistan has not developed the Fatah or Baluchi areas. It's not put resources into them. 
It has exploited Baluchistan. It has relied in Baluchistan on repression, not on reform. And when it has talked about reform, it has not executed it. The data that you find from Pakistani sources makes this all too clear. And the violence level in Baluchistan is raising as development, as you can see from those pale blue bars, falls far short of the average level of development in Pakistan, which is the darker blue. We have the fact that this is only one of a series of areas of violence. We focus on this because it affects our strategic interests. In fairness to the Pakistanis, the majority of threats to Pakistan's stability are not in this area. They are in the other parts of Pakistan, and one of the keys is the broadly permeating nature of violence and the wide variety of groups that exist throughout the country. This is a country like March of the region, which also is failing to come to grips with a massive population rise. The population is four times what it was in 1950. Under current demographics, it will be eight times what it was in 1950 by 2050. And in general, the Pakistani government has failed in every civil area to come to grips with the impact of these demographics and population growth. Reading budgets is not one of the favorite activities of people in the policy community. It should be, because when you see where the money should have gone, which is not where it has on occasion, you get an idea of how endemic the problems are and how much they're driven by failures in everything from education to infrastructure. Again, the anger at us the lack of support for this war of ours, the extent to which that people see us as a group you can have no confidence in, the confidence in President Obama before the current relations began to deteriorate was 8%, although 64% wanted relations to improve. Let me just close. We do have a strange quid pro quo. All of you know we have drone and UCAV strikes in Pakistan. When you look at the allocation of them by target, about 40% of them have nothing to do with our goals in terms of Al-Qaeda or the threat to us. They are a way of directly supporting the Pakistani government because that's the target base. It's outside the areas of our strategic interests and concerns. Our assistance has been massive. Let me go back to the word bribe. When you can't figure out where the money goes, when there is no public accountability, when you are not managing your funding streams, this is not, in the conventional sense, aid. In the military side, at least, you can see a lot of the hardware and a lot of the equipment. And you have some idea where some of the training and other funds went. In the case of U.S. civilian aid, we have zero accountability. You look through the publications from the State Department and AID, and you have a broad area of where the money went by category in the U.S. budget. But you have absolutely no idea of what we're buying, where it's going, and how it is being accounted for. And any of you who have seen the Washington Post today have probably realized this is not one of our current strengths. This is a grim picture. It was a grim picture when we developed the new strategy. It has grown grimmer with time. And unless something radical happens to change Pakistani behavior between now and 2014, Relations will probably be, at best, as strained as they are now, or see Pakistan move more and more towards trying to position itself to somehow win this transition in terms of Pakistan's strategic goals. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Bruce?
Uh, thank you very much, Craig, for that kind introduction. Thank all of you for coming today. Uh, it's always a bit of a daunting task to follow Tony on a podium like this. Usually he covers the issues so well, and usually we are in such violent agreement with each other, I find myself in a position, what am I going to talk about? Uh, or should I just sit down and let questions begin? But I'm not. Um, what I would like to focus on uh, to follow up. What I would like to focus on uh, with a little bit more detail is the U.S.-Pakistan bilateral relationship, where that is going, and then offer maybe a few thoughts on how to recalibrate the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. Let me begin, though, by saying I'm in complete agreement. Pakistan is a country uh, that has so many problems facing it. Uh, one wonders why anyone would want to be prime minister or Pakistan, a uh, president of this country. Its daunting challenges uh, from the terrorist syndicate, which now has the nation literally under siege, to its growing population demands, and to the fact that it's literally running out of water. I know that doesn't sound right. Last year they had the worst floods in their history. That was a one-off. The bottom line for Pakistan is it may follow Yemen as the second country in the world where its major cities literally do not have enough water to go on. U.S.-Pakistani relations have a very cyclical quality to them. For 60 years, the U.S.-Pakistani relationship has been like a roller coaster. We've gone up through periods of great love affair with each other, followed by bitter and ugly divorces. During the periods of great love affair, the United States throws money at Pakistan like it was a drunken sailor and asks for no accountability whatsoever. And we turn a blind eye to everything they do that we might not like. During the periods of divorce, we are angry with each other, frustrated. We call each other names. We sanction them enormously. And we achieve absolutely nothing by doing so. The consequence of this roller coaster is that Pakistanis have come to a conclusion. It's evident in the polling data you saw. The United States is not a reliable ally. Nobody in their right mind living in Pakistan would come to any other conclusion than that based on the last 60 years of American-Pakistani relations. The highs in American-Pakistani relationship have all been based around secret projects. In the 1950s and 60s, it was the U-2 base in Peshawar. In the late 60s and 70s, it was the opening to China. Then it was the war against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. And in the last decade, it was the war against Al-Qaeda. The Pakistanis actually do have nostalgia for one period in all of this. And that was the war against the Soviet Union in the Afghanistan. Because for them, that was the perfect relationship what they call Reagan rules. We give them money, actually a check, literally, and make no attempt to supervise what they do with the money. They could hand it out to whatever group they wanted, they could buy whatever they wanted with it, and they could divert as much as they wanted to their nuclear weapons program, and the United States said nothing. And in addition, the United States had almost no footprint in the country. But we're not going back there. In fact, the latest high in U.S.-Pakistani relations, which began shortly after September 11th, was already beginning to erode by the end of the Bush administration. By the end of 2007 and early 2008, the high had got, been lost and we were in decline. Three reasons for this. First, the collapse of the Musharraf government. Our man literally fell apart. We tried to stand by him till the bitter end. That just alienated the Pakistanis more. Secondly, our growing doubts about whether they were really on our side in the war against Al Qaeda. These doubts were personified in 2008 in one man, Nadim Taj, then Director General of the ISI. It's worth noting that his previous appointment before he was given Director Generalship of the ISI in September 2007 was Commandant of the Kakul Military Academy 
in Abbottabad, Pakistan. Curious coincidence. We can talk about more in questions and answers. But during his short 11-month tenure as Director General of the ISI, the United States found him doing two things. One, blowing up the Indian Embassy in Kabul, and we had their hands all over it. And two, telling every target of our drone strikes in 2007 and 8, in 2007 and 2008, that the Americans are coming, you better get out of the way. Talk about duplicity being caught, we caught this one. He was promoted to be a corps commander in the Pakistani military. And of course, the third event that led to the downturn in U.S. relations in 2008 was the Mumbai terrorist operation. I think the Obama administration deserves credit for coming in with its eyes wide open. I think it deserves credit for trying to reset U.S.-Pakistani relations. But I think the task from the beginning was daunting indeed for the reason that Tony has laid out quite well. Fundamental differences in national security outlook, fundamental differences in world outlook, fundamental doubts about each other, and fundamentally different interests in many ways. Those things are not easily changed, even by large aid budgets like Kerry Luger and impressive dialogues like the strategic dialogue we had with Pakistan for the last two years. We are now at a new turning point. Abutabad, the culmination of a number of events this year, but especially Abutabad, has put us at a new turning point. Secretary Clinton said that very clearly during her six-hour visit to Islamabad last month. Either we see some dramatic change in Pakistani behavior, and that change would be manifested in the demise of a certain known number of senior terrorist officials harbored in Pakistan today, or we're going to see this decline continue. I told Tony before the event, I am an eternal optimist about Pakistan because pessimism does nothing for you. But even I am pretty skeptical that we're going to see them take care of the hit list that Mrs. Clinton gave to the Pakistanis last month. Much more likely will be a continued deterioration and decline in the U.S.-Pakistani relationship. It could be gradual. It could be, as we've seen this year, punctuated by events like the Raymond Davis event. Or it could be much, much quicker. There are at least four scenarios which are entirely plausible, which could lead to a further and dramatic and stark reduction in U.S.-Pakistani bilateral relations. First, there's another Abutabad. There's every reason to believe that in that mountain of data we took out of that villa, we will find other information, other telephone numbers that will lead us to other targets. Second, is another Mumbai. India and Pakistan are engaged in the world's most dangerous game of Russian roulette. And it's mostly played by the Pakistanis. We are very lucky that we've not had a mass casualty terrorist attack in India in the last two and a half years. And it is almost entirely due to luck. Third, we could have another 9-11. And let me be clear what I mean by that. A mass casualty terrorist attack in the United States postmarked Pakistan. We narrowly averted one only a year and a few weeks ago in New York City. Had Faisal Shahzad been better at building a bomb, had he listened to the instructions he'd been given by the Pakistani Taliban and Al-Qaeda about how to build a bomb, he would have created a fireball in the middle of New York City in Manhattan that would have reached in five blocks in each direction. It might not have killed as many people as September 11th, but it certainly would have led to a crisis in U.S.-Pakistani relations. And the fact that his father is an Air Vice Marshal in the Pakistani Air Force would not have been overlooked by most Americans. And fourth is a coup d'etat. Uh, Pakistan is rapidly reaching the point where it's overdue 
for its next military dictator to arrive. Uh, it's a depressing cycle of Pakistani politics, but certainly nothing in the history of the Zadari Gilani government would lead anyone to believe that civilian government in Pakistan today has turned a corner and that therefore we should expect we won't return to a military government at some point. How do we reverse this? What do we do now to try to prevent these things from happening? Uh, I think the first place to start is with humility. There's not a whole lot we can do. But Pakistan is a very, 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 very difficult nut to crack. Uh, people say Afghanistan is hard. To me, Afghanistan looks surprisingly facile and easy compared to Pakistan. Humility is in order. Pakistanis will determine the future of Pakistan, not Americans. But I think that there are a couple of recalibrations or mid-course corrections that might help. One is what I call accountability. For the last decade, actually almost for the last two decades, we have been telling Pakistan to stop playing both sides of the game in the world war against Al-Qaeda and related terrorist groups. We have yelled at them. We have reasoned with them. We have argued with them. We have cajoled them. We have tried to bribe them. We have tried to isolate them. It hasn't worked. So reluctantly, I come to the conclusion we have to make it personal. We have to tell Pakistan that if we identify who Major Iqbal is, Major Iqbal is the ISI officer who worked with David Headley to set up the attack on Mumbai, we're coming after him. We're coming after him either by grabbing his assets, arresting him when he travels, or if necessary, we'll come after him with extreme measures. This won't be easy, this won't be pretty, and I'm awfully glad I don't have to be the CIA chief of station in Islamabad who delivers this message because that's one hell of a liaison relationship to manage. <laughs> but I don't see any other way to get their attention. And in any case, we're already doing it. America, through the marvels of its own political system, is seeking out accountability against the ISI through the court structure. Major General Taj, who I mentioned earlier, and his successor, General Pasha, who are soon to come to court in the city of New York in a civil court case, which I think it is a virtual certitude. They will lose. And at that point, we will attach government of Pakistan assets to pay the victims of Mumbai. And Mr. Taj and Mr. Pasha will be arrested the next time they turn up in this country. I'd rather get that business out of the court system and use it effectively by the executive branch. Secondly, I agree completely with Tony on the aid process. I think Kerry Luger was a very smart idea whose time has already passed. I don't see how this administration or any administration can convince this Congress to continue to provide $1.5 billion in economic assistance to Pakistan. I sure wouldn't want to be the administration witness who goes up there and explains to this Congress with its views about cutting spending why we're getting our money's worth out of Pakistan from that aid. And that is not a negative comment about those people involved in running this aid program. I think they're trying to do a tremendous job is not working, it is not sustainable. So we need to switch to trade. We need to decide to allow Pakistani imports into this country to face the same tariff levels as Indian imports or Chinese imports. Right now they're, tra they're tariffed at a much, much higher rate. And consequently you will not find Pakistani products in the United States of America. Every Pakistani leader since Zia al Haq has asked us to do this. Prime Minister Ghilani asked the Congress, visiting congressional delegation yesterday, to do this. It's time to listen to them. Trade, not aid, by every economics estimate, is a more effective way of building the Pakistani economy, requires no American bureaucracy and no American footprint in the country. Trade, not aid, is the second route we should take. Third is focus on the itch that drives the Pakistanis. India, India-Pakistani dynamics. 
What I don't mean here, and I want to be very clear, is an American mediator between New Delhi and Islamabad. That will not work. That is a guaranteed recipe for failure. We need to be doing something more subtle and sophisticated. We need to in use our Indian relationship to the extent we can to send a message to the Pakistanis that yes, indeed, we're going out with the other date. And if you don't like that, and if you don't want to catch on, we're prepared to go with that other date. We've got to play hardball on that with the Pakistanis. But in addition to that, we should also encourage the process which Prime Minister Singh and Prime Minister Gilani decided to start this year. The one little bit of good news in this part of the world in the last year was that cricket match in which they decided to resume talks. Now don't get me wrong, I don't have a lot of illusions that these talks are going to go very far, neither do Indians and Pakistanis. But I do understand that they are important, they are critical, and any bright ideas we have that we can give them to help assist them in moving them along, we should do so. Because at the end of the day, some kind of change in the Indian-Pakistani relationship and the dynamics of that bilateral relationship is the only thing that is fundamentally going to change Pakistan's national security calculations and its strategic movement. Which gets to my final approach, which is, it is time to bury AFPAC. I hated it from the day Richard Holbrook told me that phrase. It's time to put Afghanistan and Pakistan and India and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and Nepal back into the South Asia Bureau. It is time to break them out of, Pen out of CENTCOM and Pacific Command and deal with this part of the world holistically and think about it as an integrated part. And only when you start thinking about it as an integrated part are you likely to develop policies that will work in dealing with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce and Tony, for that rosy assessment. Um, Bruce, I want to start with you. Um, is, it, is there any way that folks involved Pindi and Islamabad could have not known that bin Laden was in Abbottabad? That is, in my view, the $64 million question of, of uh, uh, this year. Um, there are only two possibilities. And, and just to make sure we have the strategic picture here. Uh, the villa that Mr. Bin Laden was living in since probably 2006 is less than a mile from the Kakul Military Academy. At the end of, uh, the beginning of April of this year, uh, Chief of Army Staff Kayani gave a speech at the Kakul Military Academy in which he said the back of the militancy has been broken. I have this vision in my head of Osama bin Laden standing on the roof listening to Kayani as he was saying that. They're that close. In that environment, there's only two possibilities. The Pakistanis were clueless about what was going on or complicit. Clueless means they really are clueless about the jihadist Frankenstein inside their country. That raises all kinds of disturbing questions about the future of the militancy, the security of Pakistan's nuclear security, fort nuclear security, its weapons, its arsenal. Uh, it raises questions about uh, the safety of Americans living in this country. Um, that's bad enough. Complicit, I think, raises even more profound questions. Uh, when I say complicit, let me be careful what I mean. I don't mean that General Pasha visited the villa once a month to have tea with Osama bin Laden and plot worldwide terror. Something more subtle than that. Complicit would be knowing he was there and deciding that that offered them some degree of control and influence over Al-Qaeda, which was in their national interest. On the assumption that the Americans would never, ever, ever figure out what was going on. We have no proof of that today from what we hear from uh, every person in the senior ranks of this government. Uh, but on the other hand, we continue to have the question, uh, clueless 
or complicit. That question, I suspect, will haunt U.S.-Pakistani relations until we come and find out what the answer was. Tony, do you think that Pakistan will change its course fundamentally in its fight against militancy as a result of the bin Laden killing? The simple answer is why? Because as Bruce outlined, their interest has never been in the bin Laden it's, or in the Afghan Taliban as targets. Those are levers that to some extent they've always been able to use. Are we in a position to put enough pressure on them to actually have them change the hit list? Who knows? It's possible, but it seems much more likely that we will see a few scapegoats and maybe more tolerance of unmanned combat aerial vehicle strikes. At the same time, probably a reduction in special forces presence in Pakistan. And there will be more maneuvering because, as they can see, if we have a July announcement of U.S. troop guts, that that means we are going to be largely leaving in 2014, at least as a major military presence. And at that point, they have every reason to try to intervene in whatever negotiations take place between the Karzai government, the Taliban, and try to manipulate the situation to their advantage. So this was an important event or symbol for us. It was an intense embarrassment for them, just as Bruce has explained, but should it change their behavior? I think we already have problems in persuading the Congress to provide any more carrots, much less even sustain the carrots we're giving them. And it's just not clear what our sticks are when they know we've set this deadline of 2014. Bruce, Tony argued that, that our interests in Pakistan were limited to our, our operations in Afghanistan. Do you agree with that? Do you think we have core interests in Pakistan? I, would, I, would, I guess I would differentiate a little bit between interests, um, whether they're tactical or strategic, uh, and just the intrinsic importance of Pakistan. Um, you know, Pakistan is on the far side of this planet. Uh, we, we spent the first 200 years as a republic uh, largely ignoring what happened over there, and we seem to have gotten by okay. So I don't see this as a strategic interest on in the course of uh, Western Europe or Japan or something like that. At the same time, we shouldn't under, or should not ignore Pakistan's weight in and of itself. This is the sixth largest country in terms of population in the world. It will very rapidly be the fifth largest country in the world. It is the second largest Muslim country in the world. It will be the largest Muslim country in the world. Uh, it has the fastest growing nuclear arsenal in the world. And as we both have laid out, um, it has probably got more terrorists per square kilometer than any other country in the world. And many of them are focused on the United States. So I don't know whether I would refine that as strategic interests. I would just define that as this is an important country uh, and we ignore it, I think, at our peril. Uh, does that mean we have overlapping strategic interests with it? No, I don't think we have very many overlapping strategic interests with it. Tony, if this is as good as it gets with, in the relationship between the U.S. and Pakistan, are our expe expectations too high? I think first Bruce outlined the cycles. Uh, the problem, I think, are not that our, our expectations are too high if you mean the United States government. Or the people who are in Pakistan or the people who developed the strategy in Afghanistan. Bruce made a good point about interest. We would like to have better relations, friendly and solid relations with every country, and particularly those that still have some elements of democracy. But I think the fact is that we are headed down a path where unless we can somehow 
actually implement all of the suggestions Bruce made and do so successfully. And it would be unfair to ask him to assign a quantitative probability to that. Uh, we're going to certainly not see a major shift between now and transition in Afghanistan. And if the faster that transition takes place, the steeper it is and the more it basically arbitrarily or rapidly cuts both support to Afghanistan and Pakistan, probably the more the problem will increase. But even if we carry out the other scenarios, the situation has no reason to get immediately better. What would change it? If you actually had a Pakistani government that really addressed the underlying causes of why this rise in extremism and terrorism is taking place. If you had a military with more vision that saw dealing with the causes rather than repression or military action as a solution. If you had political parties which were less family oriented, less corrupt, which actually acted on reform rather than simply talked about it, then we might at some point have a partner, but do I expect any of that to happen? I couldn't name the person who would make the change in Pakistan. Maybe Bruce has some suggestions. Bruce, what scenario worries you the most? Do you have confidence in the orientation of the core commanders in the Pakistani military? You talked about a possible coup. Um, how do you assess that situation? Um, I will answer that, but I will also answer sure, his, his question. Um, I, 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 we're, in, we're again in violent agreement here. The only thing I would, I would say is that there are Pakistanis who recognize every problem we have laid out. Um, and you can get uh, on their email distribution lists and be bombarded with, with quite moving statements about what needs to be done uh, in Pakistan. And thanks to old President Obama, I'm on all those uh, email <laughs> lists. I'm also on a lot of other email lists from other people in Pakistan which are not quite so pleasant to read what they have to say about me. The problem is that those people are literally being murdered in front of our eyes. They're being murdered in front of our eyes. And the Pakistani government seems to be doing nothing about it. Um, if you want a, a Pakistani politician who would go in the right direction, uh, probably Sherry Rahman, uh, who is now living uh, basically in her house uh, under threat uh, of murder every time she goes out her front door. Um, your question, what do I worry about worst, is a coup from within the military in which the 21st century reincarnation of Zia al Haq arrives. That is to say, a Pakistani general who is a committed jihadist. Uh, in 1980, such a man came to power uh, and we were fortunately able to point him in the direction of atheistic communism next door, and together we had the highlight of U.S.-Pakistani relations as the Pakistanis see it. Um, problem is, <laughs> there's no Soviet Union around anymore, and there's no place to deflect jihadist uh, views, and it'll be reflected at us. Is it possible? Well. I think I've given you the name of a core commander who I think it is very realistic and possible, Nadim Taj. Uh, he sure smells like a committed jihadist to me. Um, uh, fortunately, uh, he's just been promoted again uh, to adjunct general of the Pakistani military. Uh, so he's no longer a core commander. Are there others like him? If I could give one piece of advice to Leon Panetta and David Petraeus about what one piece of information I would most like to know in the whole world right now, it is the true core beliefs of Pakistan's core commanders. Because one of them is going to be the next leader of this country, and we need to know who they are. Tony, what advice would you give General Petraeus? I think at this point, we are struggling to find exactly the issues that Bruce raised. It is to understand not simply the problems in Fatah or Baluchistan. 
It is to understand the problems in the country, and it is not simply the wide range of violent <laughs> extremist movements, but the internal threats within this power structure. And that is particularly true because you have a country which soon will have a major increase in its ability to produce nuclear weapons, which does manufacture missiles, and which is doing it in a climate where you are building up on both sides significant nuclear strike capabilities in an environment which is a little unique because both India and Pakistan have essentially had to lie about their nuclear testing program. They are arming nuclear weapons that they have not adequately tested or characterized, and they are arming them on missiles which they have not tested to the point where they know exactly what will happen if they're fired. Now, they are a long way away, but as Bruce points out, you have interests that go beyond strategic interests, and the whole picture of any kind of nuclear confrontation, as both sides rush to deploy capabilities they don't understand, that's a very dangerous issue. How about China? Should we worry about China and Pakistan growing closer together? You mentioned that we might sort of threaten Pakistan, and that we might start siding more with India. Couldn't they come back to us and say, well, fine, you can go with India and we're going to go with China? Is that a, is that a credible threat from their standpoint? Well, it's a threat they make. Yeah. Um, we, ha we had a, a remarkable scene recently where Pakistan's Minister of Defense, most of you don't know who that is because in Pakistan being the civilian <laughs> minister of defense in the government is the least possible important job in the entire cabinet. Um, but he did get a trip to Beijing and uh, he came back and said we're going to give China a naval base on the Arabian Sea and there was this kind of embarrassed silence for a few hours from Beijing and then a statement that came out and said well um, you know, we really don't want a naval base on the Arabian Sea, which may be a lie. Uh, I'm not a China expert, so I don't know what, I cannot tell you the Chinese part of this. But from the Pakistani standpoint, uh, they do see China as their all-weather friend, which will bail them out. Um, the truth is, in every war with India, they haven't bailed them out. Uh, they've stood on the sidelines. Um, they are an important partner for Pakistan in terms of military equipment, in terms of the nuclear uh, technology and capability that, that Tony just talked about. Um, but I think they are a more complicated ally than the Pakistanis want us to believe they are. And here I would also throw out there's another ally they have, uh, which is the Saudis and the Gulf states. And there the Arab Spring is moving the Gulf states closer to the, to the Pakistanis as a source of reliable military manpower in the event of more Bahrains and, and more internal problems in the Gulf. Um, Pakistan has alternatives to us. Uh, it likes to exaggerate the size of those alternatives, but they do have alternatives to us. If I may just make a point, I think there's another side of this than the purely military one, and that is simply trade, logistics, and the rest. And there's been a lot of talk about new Silk Roads and the rest. Well, first, Pakistan is not a particularly attractive economic structure for China. It is not a particularly good route for pipelines and roads unless you believe, A, it is completely secure, and B, you have a real reason to move from the Indian Ocean north. And in fact, when you look at what China is doing, it isn't financing a major road through Pakistan, it's financing a major road through Iran up to Herat to connect with Central Asia. And that is a massive investment for China. The other problem is that for obvious economic reasons, you have Central Asia funding east-west communication lines and lines north to Russia. So what you have is a rather peculiar subculture of people who study South Asia who are fascinated by Afghanistan and Pakistan. 
On the other hand, you have realities on the map, and they're moving east, west, and north, and in other directions, and for really clear reasons in terms of trade, economics, and energy flows. Bruce, you mentioned the Arab Spring. I wonder what you both think. Uh, is it possible to see the sort of popular uprising that we've seen in Tunisia and Egypt, Bahrain, other places, Syria? Is it, popular, is it possible to see that in Pakistan? You had the lawyers movement a few years ago, but it sort of fizzled out. Could, could there be a sort of demonstration effect in Pakistan? Well, I mean, if there's one lesson of the Arab Spring, it is don't <laughs> rule out <laughs> possibilities in the future at the risk of looking foolish uh, very quickly after you've ruled them out. Uh, so I wouldn't rule anything out. Um, I, I'd invert it a little bit. Uh, in many ways, uh, Pakistan had its Arab Spring in 2007 and 2008. You had a uh, aroused citizenry that asked for the rule of law, that asked for accountability, uh, that wanted its uh, system to be reformed and demanded the end of a dictator. And they succeeded. Um, now, maybe it would have all turned out a whole lot better if Mrs. Bhutto hadn't been murdered. Uh, but I think that's a bit of a slim hope. Um, the problems in the Pakistani system are much more endemic than that. Uh, and, you know, to give Pakistanis credit, this is their fourth time at trying to build a democratic system. I give them a lot of credit for persistence, uh, for aspiring to be a democratic modern state, but you have to believe in the triumph of hope over experience to believe that it's going to succeed. And it's not going to succeed as long as uh, the dominant political player in the country, a state within a state, the army, is so relentlessly focused on competition with India uh, that it demands a um, uh, exorbitant part of the national budget for its demands and demands total control over national security uh, be held solely in the hands of the army and the civilian political leaders not even have any involvement in it. Uh, it's, it is a army in church of the state in many ways today and that is a political uh, problem which I don't think is resolved easily through uh, the kind of political demonstrations and upheaval that we had it is more likely to go back to military dictatorship than it is to effective functioning democracy. Craig, if I may, just a I'm always a little worried about this phrase, Arab Spring. First, no two Arab Springs are alike. So we end up describing the French Revolution and the American Revolution as being identical by using that same logic and very recently I heard a senior Arab describe the Arab Spring as what you in the West don't understand is for us the spring is intensely hot and filled with sandstorms. I suspect is a little more realistic than some of the descriptions we've heard elsewhere. But what I think Bruce has pointed out, first you have much more an option in some ways as you did in Egypt between a civil elite and the military structure. And second, what you also have is not so much a national consciousness centered around one place, but a whole group of separatist, somewhat different movements which do not have reason to cohere and produce some kind of unified process of change. So you may see a power struggle between the civil and military elite, but that's not the same thing, I think, even as the Egyptian case was. Uh, we really, I think, in general need to remember that the only thing revolutions do have in common is that none of them are alike. If the military is part of the problem, should we think about putting greater conditions on the military aid that we give to Pakistan? Bruce mentioned that he thought Kerry Luger was a great idea that was past its day. The civilian aid clearly is under greater pressure in Congress. How about the military assistance? You bribe people to freedom? I mean, let's be real. Uh, 
if what we want is to maintain the lines of communication through 2014 without more trouble, not have more problems with UCAV strikes and occasionally have them do something useful when we're pushing them hard enough, it's probably not a good idea to suddenly discover we need a really good military accounting process. I can't, I can't top that that's, line. That's <laughs> mm -hmm. Bruce, you probably know the, the dynamics within the administration as well as anyone on the outside. And I was wondering if you could characterize the state of debate on Pakistan now in Washington. Will Secretary Gates' departure, will that shift the center of gravity? How do you, how do you read things? Uh, traditionally, uh, Pakistan's strongest uh, promoter inside the United States government uh, has been uh, the CIA. Uh, because the CIA argued that the relationship with the ISI, although very, very difficult, uh, produced results. Um, certainly, you know, that was the argument back in the 1980s uh, when the ISI ran the Mujahideen war for us. And that was the argument through most of the first half uh, three quarters of this decade. Uh, the, the, the formula the CIA would repeat endlessly is that the ISI is our most important ally in the war against Al Qaeda and our most difficult ally in the war against Al Qaeda. And they would point to people like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Abu Zubaydah, and others whom we had gotten through assistance of the ISI. That's changed. Uh, that has changed in the, in the last uh, year, and it certainly has changed uh, in light of the Raymond Davis affair, uh, and Abu Tabad uh, certainly uh, changes it even more. Uh, my former colleagues are uh, spending even more time than I am trying to answer my question, clueless, complicit, uh, because for them it's an even more up close and personal question. Um, if that advocate changes as it has, uh, that leaves, in essence, the uniformed military, which is arguing the case that we need them for the supply line. Um, and, you know, I had a drink with Kayani last night. He's really an okay guy. He's not as bad as he thinks. Um, the departure of Gates and the arrival of Panetta, who's going to bring with him the new CIA view, I think is also bad news for Pakistan. Now that will leave as, as the principal defender of uh, uh, engagement with Pakistan, the State Department, which of course, because it is the State Department, argues in favor of engagement with, with everybody. That's what diplomats are supposed to do. Um, its track record of winning those debates uh, not just in this administration, but in every administration, is pretty slim. Uh, it may have engagement, but it's engagement often with uh, nothing inside of it. Uh, so my reading of the tea leaves is that uh, not only does events on the ground argue that this relationship is going to get worse, bureaucratic changes and personnel changes in Washington probably will add to that tendency towards getting its worse. All that said, at the highest levels of this administration, as I said earlier, they've never had illusions about Pakistan, but they also do understand that Pakistan is an important place. And that getting angry with it, getting frustrated with it, uh, feels good, but that's not a policy. Uh, anger is not a solution to this problem. Uh, the solutions are not very good, but anger is the least effective of them. Tony, you showed our popularity plummeting in Pakistan despite all the aid we give, despite the strategic communication plan that's been cleared all the way up to the president. Is there any strategic communications plan that could work in Pakistan given the drone strikes, the bin Laden killing, the Ray Davis affair, or is it a helpless cause? I don't think it's hopeless, but I think frankly that one of our great problems is the idea that somehow you find a message, you control it, and you keep repeating it, and it somehow impacts on public opinion. If there's any place that's worked since, well, from the start of the second Bush administration, I would love to hear it. 
I think the difficulty is if you really want to communicate to people, you have to communicate with them as realistically and in as much depth as possible. And as Bruce points out, you have people, not simply on the civil side, but in the military, the intelligence security people, who are very realistic about this range of problems. What you don't have is a matching set of media. What you don't have is a political structure that does a good job of communicating it. And I think the other problem is until Pakistan's domestic politics can address Pakistan's problems, they can't be realistic about us. And that's the tragedy. It wouldn't matter that much if Pakistanis were angry at the United States. What does matter is the inability to focus on education, population, water, infrastructure, the failure of the central government to respond in emergencies like the flood, all of the things the people actually need. And with that, the threat that is posed by religious and separatist extremist groups. A threat which in many ways is not directed towards us or Afghanistan or anyone on the outside. It's caused by the problems on the inside. You all have been very patient. We have about 20, 25 minutes for questions. Please state your name, affiliation, and please ask a question rather than offer a speech. Go ahead, please. We have microphones in the room. Wait, wait for the microphone, too. Yeah. Uh, Marisa Lino from Northrop uh, Grumman. A uh, simple question. Not unreasonable uh, hypothetical that there will be a deal cut between the government in Kabul and the Taliban. How does that change the equation? Well, the practical problem is it can be any deal under the sun. When you cut this kind of deal, are you cutting it around us or with us? Are you cutting it with a group of Taliban which might actually accept a political role? Or is this simply a cosmetic device by the Taliban to try to manipulate the situation? Is it Sheikh Omar, which seems a somewhat uncertain deal? Uh, this particular group of bedfellows is always possible in politics, but the idea of Omar and Karzai is not something that strikes me as immediately possible. You have the problem of Haqqani, and how does Haqqani fit into this structure? The other thing to remember is we are still fighting, in many ways, a tactical war to try to transform Afghanistan into a state with a more effective government with popular support. The Taliban is fighting a war of political attrition, where in many ways they want to expand their influence, expand their control, and simply outweigh us, which is what they need to do to win if the Afghan government remains weak and something they can exploit. So the problem with most of these deals, particularly, until the Taliban can be firmly convinced that they're going to lose unless they reach some kind of accommodation, is that this kind of negotiation can simply be an extension of insurgency by other means. And we've seen that in Cambodia, and we've seen it in Nepal, and a great many other areas. It's compounded by the fact that there are a number of countries in ISAF, Germany in particular, that simply want out under any form of political accommodation possible. So the pressure isn't simply pressure that affects the key negotiating partners. It's pressure within NATO and ISAF, and there are elements certainly here in the United States of people who believe that, frankly, if we can't create a stable end state anyway, accommodation and departure is the better part of valor. I just want to add one thing. I, I agree with all of that. I'm, I'm, I am in favor of a political process, but I'm deeply skeptical that a political process is going to emerge 
I'm deeply skeptical that if it does emerge, it will produce the outcomes we want. I have a fear that a political process between Karzai and the Taliban will lead to the collapse of the Northern Alliance as Abdullah Abdullah and others say, we're not interested in, in, in a, a political process with people whom we regard as our mortal enemy. But I just also want to uh, put an inconvenient fact out there. Um, there is a great hope in certain circles here and in many, many circles in Europe that the Taliban can be split from Al-Qaeda that these are not necessarily bound together organizations. Um, well, there is an inconvenient fact. Less than 96 hours after Osama bin Laden was killed, the Taliban Shura Council put out a eulogy and bemoaned this disastrous moment that has come to the Islamic world and lauded Mr. bin Laden as a hero of Islam, as a hero of their movement as a defender of Afghanistan, as a hero of the Palestinian cause. Everything that you would not want the Afghan Taliban to say about Osama bin Laden, they said it. Now, we can dismiss it as propaganda if you want to. People will say, oh, you know, they got carried away by the moment. Well, <laughs> you do that at your own peril. I think the Afghan Taliban revealed the relationship between Al-Qaeda. I suspect that in that mountain of data that they're going through, uh, they're going to find a lot more communications between uh, Mr. Bin Laden and Taliban commanders uh, than people uh, would want to find. You're on the Quidditch's distribution list as well. Yes. <laughs> I get a lot of weird emails. <laughs> Please, in the back. Uh, my name is Vincent Wong from University of Richmond. Um, I share your frustration. Uh, you have used the word a cyclical relationship to describe U.S.-Pakistani relationship. Uh, I wonder if we can really afford uh, to dis divorce Pakistan. Um, Bruce mentioned some of the intrinsic importance of Pakistan, and I'll add, just add a few more. Some of this has have to do with negative importance. Uh, if we could drive Pakistan into China's orbit, uh, they can um, continue prolif uh, you know, proliferating the AQ Khan uh, network come to mind. They can provide a sanctuary to Al Qaeda and so on. So I wonder if a marriage of convenience is a possibility. Um, I don't think either Tony or I are ad advocating divorce. Um, we're not. We're not here in the business of saying let's break with Pakistan and and enter a hostile relationship. Uh, what we're trying to be is realistic, that engagement prospects of success were always small and look smaller today than they did uh, two years ago, uh, three years ago when President Obama was elected. And I think we have to deal with that reality. There are all kinds of negatives of a Pakistan that is uh, even more hostile uh, than the one we have today. I, Craig asked me what my nightmare scenario is. My nightmare scenario is a jihadist state in Pakistan where through the instrument of a military coup, a true believer in global Islamic jihad takes control of the fastest growing nuclear arsenal in the world, the fifth largest country in terms of population. What would we do about that? Uh, try to wrap your head around what American strategy would you deal with to deal with a country like that. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, engage them. They're not likely to be interested in engaging us. Uh, we're going to contain them. Well, we might have some success in that because virtually everyone else would also find it as dangerous. But containment is always a long-term approach. Are we going to use kinetic force? Are we going to use force against Pakistan? Uh, should we invade Pakistan? Uh, I, I know your reaction is, this guy's nuts, but we have invaded three Islamic countries in the last decade. One, we kind of only invade their airspace, but we still invaded their airspace. But in the case of Pakistan, this really would be insanity, taking on a nuclear-armed enemy with 180 million people who, as, as Tony's poll charts show us, 
are not exactly ready to be won over to the American way of life uh, by some GIs with bubble gum. Um, it can get much worse. We're not advocating that. We're not in favor of divorce. But I think realism is important in thinking about the future of U.S.-Pakistani relations. We are in a dark place and it's getting worse. I think that first I'm going to have to try to get away from the mental image of Rambo Part 9 as <coughs> we go in to get the nuclear weapons in Pakistan. Whereas Sylvester Stallone when we really need him. And I don't say that totally facetiously because people say, well, it's a nuclear power and therefore we have to what? And sometimes you get these fantasies, we're going to bomb them out of nuclear weapons uh, or we're going to send in special forces. Uh, frankly, that is an extraordinarily dangerous image. What we also have to recognize is when we talk about transitioning out of Afghanistan, there is a question, will we leave enough people to keep the structure together for a while? Can it hold together on its own? If we do, instead of tr fully transitioning in 2014, actually sustain the Afghan National Force development through 2020 and beyond, which is the real world plan if you want it to hold together. If we do that, do we maintain a capability and some kind of presence to deal with extremism in Pakistan that attacks terrorist targets, the so-called counterterrorism strategy? If so, what do we have to pay the Pakistanis and what do we have to give them to implement it? These are all strategies which we may find ourselves thrust into. They don't give you, however, anything like the presence or the leverage that we have now. We have $107 billion worth of military operations funded this year, $4 billion worth of aid, $7 billion worth of additional money to deal with VA and the medical costs of the war, which accumulate with time with the wounded and other people who are eligible. Are we ever going to sustain even a fraction of that beyond 2014 if we do it even that long? And if so, what is our leverage in this region? What kind of aid would actually work with Pakistan? And what is our policy toward South Asia and toward Central Asia at a time when, yes, we have interests in Pakistan, we have interests in Latin America, we have interests in Japan, and we are headed toward a period in time when we have to be much more careful about how we allocate these resources than we have been in the past. These are all very hard choices, but what they all warn you against is focusing only on the present in Pakistan as one country of particular interest. We've spent the last decade without a regional strategy towards anybody. We can't afford to have a Pakistan-centric strategy or an Afghan-centric strategy in the future. Yeah, right here. Mohammed Atif at DOA. First to Bruce, what makes you think that Pakistan can become a jihadist country? Uh, yes, they do not trust United States, but uh, they are being killed by these uh, jihadists who believe in global jihad. Uh, secondly, when we talk about political negotiations with Taliban in Afghanistan, where do we leave Pakistan in regards to its long-time belief that uh, one day U.S. Uh, is going to leave Pakistan with Afghanistan uh, to deal with the situation. Secondly, uh, how do we look at the relationship uh, with uh, their relationship with Haqqani Group and their long-time wish to have a major role in Afghanistan after 2014? Thank you. Um, I, I think the answer to the first question is, as I said before, a coup which has a reincarnation of Zia al-Haq. Um, 
The Pakistani army is at war with part of the Frankenstein it created, and it is in bed with part of the Frankenstein it's created. Uh, the uh, complexity, the contradictions uh, that go on in the Pakistani army's behavior towards uh, jihadism uh, are uh, difficult for the American mind to comprehend. Uh, but it is these contradictions and these complexities which make this such an important and difficult problem to deal with. Um, is such a coup imminent? Is it inevitable? No. Uh, is it possible? Certainly. Uh, is it uh, the most likely outcome? Fortunately, I don't think so. Uh, Craig was asking me for my nightmares. But usually your nightmares are not the most likely thing that's going to happen to you next day. But you ought to pay attention to worst case scenarios. Not be obsessed by them either. The question of Pakistan's role in a future political process in Afghanistan uh, seems to me to be, first of all, a question that should be addressed to Afghans. Um, countries do not have a right to be involved in the internal political process of their neighbors without invitation. Uh, and the problem for Pakistan and Afghanistan is it is perceived to have invited itself in uh, over the course of the last 30 years without invitation. Um, if you think my uh, doubts about the honesty of the Pakistani army uh, in its dealings with Afghanistan are extreme, uh, you should talk to Amar al Saleh, the <laughs> former head of Afghan intelligence. Amar al Saleh is a very interesting case. He's been saying for the last five years one thing over and over again. Osama bin Laden is not hiding in a cave. He is hiding in the heartland of Pakistan, in a Pakistani military garrison, probably protected by the ISI. Everything but that last statement is now a fact. He was right about Pakistan. I think if I may turn to Afghanistan, the issue isn't just the Haqqani network. It's 2015. Karzai has either changed the constitution or he's gone. No one has emerged under Karzai as a strong, competent leader. Any of us who have met some of the other would-be Afghan leaders have good reason to be extremely cautious about what comes next if it isn't Karzai. <laughs> Who in the southern Pashtuns now has what political status? How separate are the southern Pashtuns from the northern Pashtuns? How is the Haqqani network then fitted in to the Taliban generally? Is the Quetta Shura even at that point still real? Is Omar still around? How much of the central government has actually evolved in a positive direction versus a lot of polls which indicate that basically it has not improved in popularity as a result of the new strategy nationally, just in the areas where we've now provided added security in the south and Kandahar. What is the status of the northern groups in Afghanistan? And having had two failed elections, one for president and one for parliament, and having created a legislative body which has no clear function, even if it is properly elected, because we never really gave them the control over money that any legislature should have, <laughs> What actually evolves? Since we can't, at this point in time, answer a single one of those questions predictably, and we have no transition plan that anybody has articulated, either in Afghanistan or the administration, to move toward a goal that would deal with them, I would just suggest to you that we need to look far beyond 2014 as quickly as possible, particularly because something people forget again and again in this city is for us to act, we need money. We're already drafting the FY 2013 budget submission. 
That will fund the transition year. If we do that as we now are without any guidance as to the plan for transition, we present a lot of problems for us that potentially we could avoid. And this is the kind of reality we face when we start talking substance as distinguished from political concepts and good intentions. I think we have time for one or two more if there are other questions. Yeah, please. Please wait for the microphones. Come. Sure. Yeah. My name is Soraya Sadid. I'm uh, with Help the Afghan Children. I'm an Afghan American, have been working in Afghanistan and Pakistan for the past 18 years. My question is that how often Afghans, especially the civil society of Afghanistan, are actually engaged or involved in the decisions that are made for Afghans uh, in Afghanistan or about Afghanistan or the future of Afghanistan? Are they being consulted or at least their opinions are considered? Thank you. I think that the answer is which Afghans? First, you've had two elections. Afghans ran. We certainly, no one on the outside suggested who should run in these elections. You do have an Afghan government which is being steadily strengthened. The fact is, at this point in time, the aid money vastly exceeds the capacity of the government to spend it, much less spend it wisely. So the ministries themselves can't execute the budgets they draft. When you talk about civil society, we have, as a result, moved money to give independent funds for provincial governors because the Constitution does not provide a way of funding the governors. You've created a structure to help train and create deputy uh, district governors. You've created a structure to try to empower local jurors through the aid process. I'm not sure who it is in the Afghan process that is excluded from this. The fact is that if you look at what has actually happened, you keep hearing people in the Afghan government say, we should control the money. And then you look at what happens when you give it to them. And frankly, you've already exceeded by far their ability to deal with it at this point in time. Let me say that you're not going to put this kind of money into NGOs. You are reforming the contracting process. That won't give Afghans as a whole more decisions, but the whole idea is to get away from a contracting process that had major subcontractors and go directly to Afghan contractors. That hopefully would also solve some of the security and other issues. But this isn't something where you suddenly call a large popular assembly in Kabul and ask people what they're doing. I, it's also a fact that while they're not normally published, you're running quarterly polling of Afghans to figure out their perceptions and wants. And certainly you've responded because what Afghans have wanted by way of aid has been not development in the classic sense, but relatively simple schools, local electric power, better roads, and water, and of course, security. They've also wanted to have government services and less corruption. But this is very much a matter for Afghans to solve, not for us. We can run anti-corruption drives and run the training programs and build up governance. But while those can sometimes help, they do not reform societies. Or if they do, we don't have a single example of success since World War II. And it is not imminent anywhere I know of. Well, you can help people help themselves. Final question. 
Okay, please join me in thanking Bruce Rydell and 24th.